This is AP Psychology, Chapter 13 on Emotion. Emotions are physiological responses that involve an interplay among psychological arousal and expressive behavior and conscious experience. James Lang argued that we feel emotion after we discuss our bodily responses. Canon Bard contended that we feel emotion when our body responds. Schachter and Singer's two-factor theory states that to experience emotion, we must be aroused cognitively and then label the emotion. Although emotional arousal is not undifferentiated as Schachter and Singer believed, arousal from diverse emotions can spill over from one to another. Although physical arousal that occurs with the different emotions is for the most part indistinguishable, researchers have discovered, discovered subtle differences in brain circuits, finger temperatures and hormones. In using physiological arousal indicators to detect lies, the polygraph does better than chance, but not nearly as well enough to justify its widespread use. Some emotional responses are immediate as sensory input bypasses the cortex, triggering rapid reaction outside our conscious awareness. Others, especially responses to complex emotions, require interpretation. We decipher people's emotions by reading their bodies, voices, and faces, although some gestures are culturally determined, facial expressions such as those happiness and fear are universal. Facial expressions not only communicate emotion, but also amplify the felt emotions. Carol Azard identified 10 basic emotions, joy, interest, surprise, sadness, anger, disgust, contempt, fear, shame, and guilt, most of which are present in infancy. In describing their emotions, people place them uh, along two basic dimensions, arousal and balance. This chapter examines three emotions in detail, fear, anger, and happiness. Although we seem biologically predisposed to acquire some fears, what we learn through experience best explains the variety of human fears. Anger is most often aroused by frustrating or insulting acts that seem willful and unjustified. Expressing anger may be temporarily calming, but in the long run it can actually arouse more anger. Happiness boosts people's perception of the world and their willingness to help others. However, even significant good events seldom increase happiness for long, a fact explained by the adaption level and relative deprivation principles. An emotion is a response of the whole organism that involves an interplay among physiological arousal. The James Lang theory states that our experience of an emotion is a consequence of our physiological response to a stimulus. We are afraid because of our heart pounds, uh, pounds in, say in response to approaching anger. So our controversy is, does physiological arousal precede the fo the, or follow our emotional experience? Does cognition thinking precede the emotion feeling? When you become happy, your heart starts beating faster. First comes... The, comes conscious awareness and then comes physiological activity. This is our common sense view of our emotion. The James Lang's theory suggests that William James and Carl Lang proposed the idea that was diametrically opposed to this common sense view. The James Lang theory proposes that physiological activity precedes the emotion. So as you see a car approaching you uh, crossing the center line, your heart begins to beat fast, and then you feel the fear of emotion. The canon Bard theory, on the other hand, proposes that the physiological response and the subjective experience of emotion occur simultaneously. The heart is pounding faster, and the fear occur at the same time. One does not cause the other. So you see the car crossing the center line, you get your heart starts beating faster and you feel fear all at the same time. 
Stanley Schachter and Jerome Sanger proposed yet another theory which suggests our physiological cognitions create emotions. Emotions have two factors, arousal and cognitive label. So Schachter Singer's two-factor theory of emotion focuses on the interplay of thinking and feeling, not on the timing of the feelings. This theory states the experience of emotion, one, must be physically aroused, and two, cognitively label that arousal. The autonomic nervous system controls arousal. We know that emotions evolve bodily responses. Some of these responses are very noticeable, butterflies in our sto stomach perhaps, when, we, when fear arises, but others are more difficult to discern, such as the neurons activating in your brain. During the emotional experience, our autonomic nervous system mobilizes energy in the body that arouses us. In an emergency, the sympathetic nervous system mobilizes our fight or flight response mechanism, directing the adrenal glands to release hormones that increase the heart rate, blood pressure, and blood sugar level. Other physical changes include tensed muscles, dry mouth, dilated pupils, slowed digestion, increased sweating. The parasympathetic nervous system calms the body after a crisis has passed, although arousal dismissal gradually. Arousal in short surplus in short spurts is adaptive. We perform better under moderate arousal, but optimal performance varies with the task and difficulty. Ultimately, what we would like to seek is a moderate level of arousal uh, at all times. So in day-to-day -day life, our performance on a task is usually best when the arousal is moderate. Through this varies with the difficulty of a task. With easy tasks, peak performance comes with relatively high arousal, which enhances the dominant, usually correct response. With more difficult ta tasks, the optimal arousal is somewhat less. Uh, for instance, in the study of men who inhaled nasal spray spiked with oxytocin gave more money to partners in a risky investment game than men who sniffed a spray containing no active ingredient. More specifically, each of the 58 male college students was paid $64 to participate in the experiment. They were paired off with one man randomly assigned the role of an investor and the other the role of a trustee. Each participant received 12 tokens valued at 32 cents, redeemable at the end of the study. The investor in each pair had to decide how many tokens to give to the trustee. Both participants sitting face to face knew the researcher would quadruple the investment. The trustee then determined whether to keep the entire enhanced pot or give some portion of the proceeds, whatever seemed fair to the investor. Results indicated that among those who inhaled the oxytocin, about half gave all their tokens to the trustees. Most of the rest contributed a majority of their tokens. However, only one-fifth of the investors who had inhaled the placebo gave all their tokens and another one-third offered a majority. The oxytocin influenced only investors, that is, the trustees returned the comparable amounts of money after inhaling at either spray. Interestingly, trustee responses were generous when the investors offered most of their tokens but were stingy when they offered few. Also, replacing the trustee with a computer using a random payoff dropped the volunteers' investment rates back to the normal and suggested, argued that the researchers that trust not risk-taking is the emotional factor influenced by the hormone. The influence of oxytocin suggests that neuroscientist Antonio Damasio is a remarkable fi finding. He previously argued that the hormone acts to promote love and it adds to trust, trust to the mix. For there is no love without trust. Political scientist Amati Etizoni urged caution, however, in interpreting these findings. A chemical may move us over a bit in one direction or another, but the notion that it will make us trust someone we otherwise would not is way beyond the study shows what the study shows or can be expected. 
Similar psychological arousal occurs during fear and anger and sexual arousal. Nonetheless, these emotions feel different. And despite the arousal, sometimes our facial expression, expressions differ during these three states. For example, people may appear paralyzed with fear or ready to explode with anger. Fear and rage, sometimes accompanied by differing finger temperatures and hormone secretions, emotions may stimulate different facial muscles. During fear, brow muscles tense. During joy, muscles in the cheek under the eye pull into a smile. Emotions differ much more in brain circuits they use. For example, brain scans show increased activity in the amygdala during fear. Finally, emotions activate different areas of the brain's cortex. The right prefrontal cortex becomes more electrically active as people experience negative emotions such as disgust. The left front lobe shows more activity with positive emotions. Psychologist Richard Davison has recently uh, collaborated with Tenzin Gyatso, known as the 14th Dalai Lama, in March of 2000, they met in Dharamsala, India to measure brain waves of one senior Tibetan monk. He proved to, to have most left-sided asymmetry ever recorded. To assess whether, his reflect, whether this reflected the effect of training, Davidson joined when John Kabat-Zinn, who uses a, a form of mindfulness meditation rooted in Buddhist strategies to teach stress reduction. Their research participants were drawn from workers employed in high-stress jobs in the biotechnology industry. A total of 41 were taught mindfulness meditation and practiced it for eight weeks. The brainwave patterns and those control subjects who did not receive the training were assessed before the eight-week period. Before training, all participants tended to tended, uh, toward a right side uh, asymmetry consistent with the experience of chronic stress. Compared with control subjects, those who learned and practiced new meditation strategy showed a significant shift toward left-sided asymmetry. They reported feeling more energized and less anxious. Interestingly, the meditations also showed a more robust immune response to a flu shot. In short, practicing mindful meditation appears to alter human biology and these changes seem to foster more positive emotion traits writing in the new york times the dalai lama suggested the mindfulness meditation is a non-sectarian strategy involving a state of alertness in which the mind does not get caught up in the thoughts or sensations but lets them come and go much like watching a river flow these methods are not just useful, but, but inexpensive. You do not need a drug or an injection, and you don't have to become a Buddhist or adopt any particular religion. Everyone has the potential of leading a peaceful and meaningful life. So what is the connection between how we think and how we feel? Can we change our emotions and change our thinking? The spillover effect occurs when arousal from one event affects our response to other events. Dozens of experiments show the stirred up state can be experienced as different emotions depending on how we label it. Arousal fuels emotions and cognition channels it. An arousal response to one event spills over into our response to the next event. Arousal from a soccer match can fuel anger which may then lead to rioting. Cognition does not always precede emotion. Subliminally presented happy face can encourage subjects to drink more when presented with an angry face. Emotions are felt directly through the amygdala or through the cortex. Cognition does not always precede the emotion. When fearful eyes were subliminally presented to subjects the fMRI scans revealed higher levels of activity in the amygdala. Zajic and Ledoux emphasized that some emotions are immediate without conscious appraisal. Lazarus, Schachter, and Singer emphasized that appraisal also determines our emotions. 
emotions are expressed on the face by the body and by an intonation of the voice and is nonverbal language of emotion universal. So the U.S. government agencies have spent millions of dollars uh, administering polygraph tests to tens of thousands of employees at Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico. Wen Ho Lee was fired in March of 1999 after he failed an FBI laboratory, uh, an FBI administered polygraph test and refused to cooperate with the government's investigation of Chinese espionage at the nation's premier nuclear weapons research facility. The FBI's position that when Ho Li lied on the polygraph test in 98 led to 59 charges, all but one of which were dropped in a plea bargain two years later. The case led to a request from the National Academy of Sciences to report on the validity of the test. Ironically, some of the politicians who called for polygraphs for, of federal employees are now themselves targets of FBI investigation aimed at identifying who leaked classified information about two intercepted messages that that hinted at the September 11th terrorist attacks. Intelligence Committee staffers and legislators who have been responsible for the leak have refused to take the polygraph. Allowing the executive branch to submit the legislative branch to a lie detector test raises constitutional issues of separation of powers, claimed Senator Shelby, who was himself a target of the investigation who had declined to take the test. Disagreements over the value of the po <coughs> polygraph have also been have been so strong that the NAS deliberately sought members for its review committee who had never taken a position regarding the utility of the test. My primary qualification is I've never worked on the topic, stated Committee Chair Stephen Weidenberg, who was a statistics expert at Carnegie Mellon. Several psychologists, including Paul Ekman, also served on the panel. The NAS report issued in late 2003 concluded that the federal government should not rely on polygraph examinations for screening prospective or current employees to identify spies or other national security risks because the results are too inaccurate. The st summary stated that almost all, a century of research in scientific psychology or physiology provides little basis for the expectation that a polygraph test could have extremely high accuracy. The physiological responses measured by the polygraph are not uniquely related to deception. That is, the responses measured by the polygraph do not all reflect a single underlying process. A variety of psychological or physiological processes, including some that can be consciously controlled, can affect polygraph measures. The report concludes that the polygraph's accuracy is inadequate for secretary screening, or excuse me, security screenings for two reasons. First, accuracy is almost certainly lower when tests are used this way rather than an investigation of specific incidents. Second, the large groups of people being checked include only a tiny percentage of individuals who are guilty of targeted offenses. Tests sensitive only in a, uh, enough to spot most violators will also erroneously mark large numbers of innocent test takers as guilty. National security is too important to be left to, to such a blunt instrument, said Feinberg. The polygraph's serious limitations in employee security screenings underscore the need to look more broadly for effective alternative methods. The committee called for a broad program of research that would provide the government with the most scientifically sound methods for deterring and detecting major security risks as well as make authorities aware of strengths and weaknesses of security strategies. The effort would support a variety of activities from basic research on discouraging and uncovering security threats to applied research on administering well-founded screening techniques. In September 2003, the Department of Energy, who sponsored the review, announced that they were eliminating the routine polygraph screening of most employees. 
Under the new plan, the random tests would be limited to 4,500 rather than 20,000. Employees with the greatest access to secure programs. Furthermore, employees were, uh, whose polygraph results indicated deception would be investigated, not fired. Nor would such employees lose access to secret programs unless the investigation confirmed that they were a security risk. Deputy Secretary Energy Kyle McSarlow stated that the bottom line is that we intend for the polygraph screen to serve as a trigger that may often be used for, useful for subsequent investigation. Sometimes we experience unlabeled emotions. Sensory input can follow a pathway that leads via the thalamus to the amygdala, bypassing the cortex and triggering a rapid reaction that is outside our conscious awareness. Other more complex emotions, such as guilt, happiness, and love, require interpretation uh, a route, uh, routed along the slower road of the cortex analysis. So most of us are good at deciphering emotions through nonverbal communication in a crowd. A single happy face will pop out faster. So if you see here in our example, you'll see the happy face quicker than you'll see the sad face. So all of us communicate non-verbally. For example, a firm handshake immediately conveys an outgoing expressive personality. With a gaze averted glance or a stare, we can communicate intimacy, submission, or dominance. Most people detect nonverbal cues, and we are especially sensitive to nonverbal threats. Research indicates that we read fear and anger mostly in the eyes, happiness from the mouth. Introverts, introverts are better emotion detectors than, uh, than extroverts. Women are much better at discerning nonverbal emotions than men. When shown sad, happy, scary film clips, women express more emotions than men. Detecting and communicating emotion. Most people find it difficult to detect deceiving emotions. Even trained professionals like police officers, psychiatrists, judges, and polygraphs detected deceiving emotions only 54% of the time. So when you look at these two pictures, which of Paul Ekman's smiles is a genuine smile? In the classical Hindu dance, the body is trained to effectively convey 10 different emotions. So we have cultural and emotional expression. When these culturally diverse people were shown basic facial expressions, they did fairly well at recognizing them. And as you can see, even though these people are from different cultures, they appear to have uh, expressed themselves in much the same way. Emotional life is shaped by a cultural context. The text notes that in the Asian and other cultures that emph emphasize independent, interdependence, displays of sympathy, respect, and shame are more common than in the West. The Japanese word ame literally means sweet dependency and refers in the expectation of care by others. The confident presumption of security that a happy child has in the presence of a loving mother. Although the feeling may be universal, the other languages, including English, have no equivalent word. The fact that the word is uniquely Japanese suggests that not only that the emotion is a pervasive one in the country, but also that the Japanese culture is structured to encourage its expression. In the bestseller, The Anatomy of Dependence, Take Doi writes, the Ame is a key concept for understanding not only the the psychological makeup of the individual, but the structure of Japanese society as a whole. In contrast, Japanese, the Awaldi Ali Bedouins of Egypt, 
and Western desert value autonomy above all else and thus project an image of invulnerable independence. Feeling of loss and hurt are not expressed in public. Instead, the person displays indifference or anger or assigns blame. Learning that her husband of 20 years had decided to divorce her, a woman named Sophia reported, I never liked him. At the same time, the Bedouins permit a second, more poetic expression of emotion with one's intimates. Thus, in discussing her divorce with a few close friends in the community, Sophia recited the haiku-like poem, Jinawa, or Little Song, in which she expressed a very different reaction. Memory stirred by emotion, mention of the beloved one, should, re, should I release, I find myself flooded. Known for their calm friendliness, Tahitians and Polynesians also display emotions very different from Westerners. In particular, the Tahitian language lacks terms for sadness, uh, belonging, or loneliness. Instead, the islanders interpret such sensations as a kind of sickness. This view probably reflects their awareness of how disturbing expressions of extreme sadness could be to their tightly bound community. On the other hand, Tahitians can express one category of presence of the supernatural. They also have many more words for anger and fear. For example, the presence of supernatural. For example, they, di they differentiate between fear and something happening now and the fear of something that might happen in the future. Despite the many descriptions for anger, however, the emotion is rarely expressed in Tahiti. Sometimes it may be the case that they are more, clear, more clearly people can articulate their feelings, the better they can manage them. Women generally surpass men at reading people's emotional cues. Women's nonverbal sensitivity gives them an edge at detecting deception. Their skill at decoding others' emotions may contribute to their greater emotional responsiveness in both positive and negative situations. When surveyed, women are more likely than men to describe themselves as empathetic. Gender differences also appear in the emotions that women and men express best. Women surp surp surpass men in conveying happiness, but men communicate anger much better. Facial muscles reveal signs of emotions, but most people find it difficult to detect expressions of deceit. Training them to discern lying versus truth-telling boosts accuracy rates. When people are not seeking to deceive us, we do much better. In fact, our brains are rather amazing detectors of subtle expressions. Specific interpretations of postures and gestures risky are risky because different expressions may convey, convey the same emotion. Folded arms, for example, can signify irritation or relaxation. The absence of gestures, facial expressions, and tones of voice in emails deprives us of all an important source of information. Although some gestures are culturally determined, facial expressions such as those of happiness and fear are common all over the world. Cultures and languages also share similarities in the ways they categorize anger, fear, etc. Children's facial expressions, even those of blind children have never seen a face, are also universal. Charles Darwin suggested that before our ancestors communicated in words, their ability to convey threats, greetings, and submissions with facial expressions helped them survive. Emotional expressions may also enhance our survival in other ways. For example, surprise widens the eyes, enabling us to take in more information. Disgust wrinkles the nose, closing it for foul odors. Cultures differ in how much they express emotions. For example, in cultures that value individuality, intense and prolonged displays of emotion are frequent. They are frowned on in countries such as Japan. The facial feedback hypothesis proposes that expressions amplify our emotions by activating muscles associated with specific states. 
The muscles signal the body to respond as though we are experiencing those states. For example, students induced to make frowning expression reported feeling a little angry. Students induced to smile felt happier and found cartoons funnier. Similarly, the behavior feedback hypothesis assumes that if we move our body as we would when experiencing some emotion, shuffling along with the downcast eyes as when sad, we are likely to feel that emotion to some degree. In, if, fa if facial expressions are manipulated like frowning, and browse, people feel sad while looking at sad pictures, attaching two golf tees to the face and making their tips touch causes the brow to furrow. Carol Lazard's investigations identified 10 basic emotions, joy, interest, excitement, sadness, anger, disgust, contempt, fear, and guilt, as well as shame. Although other researchers argue for additional emotions, Lazard contends that, that other emotions are combinations of these 10. When psycho psychologists have asked people to report their experience of different emotions, all seem to place emotions along the dimensions of pleasant versus unpleasant, which is the emotions valence, and, and high versus low for arousal. The valence dimension can be seen in successful exam takers who more or than their less successful counterparts. Label arousal as energizing rather than threatening. Our arousal dimension, terrified, is more frightened than afraid, and delighted is happier than happy. People generally divide emotions into two dimensions, positive, negative, or low arousal and high arousal. Jonathan Haidt uh, has done research, uh, research in elevation. Haidt suggests that uh, a warm, uplifting feeling that people experience when they see unexpected acts of human goodness, kindness, and compassion. Having conducted research on disgust, including social disgust, the emotional reaction people have to witnessing others move down the moral leader, exhibiting their lower, baser nature, Haight wondered whether a corresponding emotion might be triggered by observing people move up the moral ladder, demonstrating their higher, better, more saintly nature. Preliminary evidence suggests that there is such an emotion. The most commonly cited circumstance is of elevation involves seeing someone give help or aid to another who is poor or sick or stranded in a difficult situation. Hate illustrates that one powerful detailed self-report, myself and three guys from church were going home from volunteering our services at the Salvation Army that morning. It had been snowing since the night before and the snow was a thick blanket on the ground. As we were driving through a neighborhood near where I lived, I saw an elderly woman woman with a shovel in her driveway. I did not think much of it, and when one of the guys in the back asked the driver to let him off here, the driver had not been paying much attention, so he ended up circling back around towards the lady's home. I had assumed this guy just wanted to save the driver some effort and walk the short distance to his home, although I was clueless as to where he lived. But when I saw him jump out of the back seat, approached the lady. My mouth dropped in shock, and I realized that he was offering to shovel her walk for her. Observers of unexpected goodness typically describe themselves as surprised, stunned, and emotionally moved. Their experience often changes their views about humanity in a more optimistic way and triggers more pro-social goals for themselves. Asked, did the feeling give you an inclination toward doing something? The frequent response was to describe a generalized desire to help others and to become a better person. Many also describe a kind of openness and urge to be playful. For example, the woman who described the snow shoveling episode stated, I felt like jumping out of the car and hugging this guy. I felt like singing and running or skipping and laughing, just being active. I felt like saying nice things about people, writing beautiful poem or a love song, playing in the snow like a child, telling everyone about this deed. 
the experiences are potentially life-altering moved when some so many people come to visit and support his family while his grandfather was dying one research participant described how the feelings persisted seven years later and influenced his decision to become a doctor in another study he compared the reactions of those who saw clips from a documentary of mother Teresa's life with those who watched a comedy or an interesting but non-emotional documentary Relative to the control subjects, those seeing the actions of Mother Teresa reported feeling more loving and inspired more strongly wanting to perform pro-social actions and were actually more likely to volunteer to work at a humanitarian organization. The feelings of elevation also seem to foster love, admiration, and desire for closer affiliation with the performer of the good deed. The woman in the snow shoveling incident continued, my spirit was lifted even higher than it already was. I was joyous, I was happy, I was smiling, I was energized. I went home and gushed about it until my sweet mates who clutched at their hearts. And although I had never seen this guy as more than just a friend, I felt a, felt a hint of romantic feelings for him that moment. Hate concludes that witnessing good deeds changes the thought and action of rep action repertoire it fosters love admiration and affection for altruists and makes the affiliate affiliative behavior more likely so fear is often an adaptive response fear of enemies binds people together and fear of injury protects us from harm what we learn through the experience best explains the variety of human fears through conditioning associating emotions with specific situations and observation watching others display fear in response to certain events or surroundings the short list of naturally painful frightening events multiplies into a long list of human fears some fears are easier to learn than others the amygdala in the brain associates emotions like fear with certain situations. We seem biologically prepared to learn some fears faster than others. We quickly, quickly learn to fear snakes and spiders and cliffs, but we are less predisposed to fear cars and electricity, bombs and global warming. A key factor to fearing, fear learning lies in the amygdala, a limbic system neural center deep in the brain. The amygdala receives information to from cortical areas that process emotion and it sends information to other areas that produce bodily symptoms of fear Indivi individual differences in fear are partly genetic Ray Elf, uh, Ray, Rayf Adolf and his colleagues at the University of Iowa report the case of a 30 year old woman known as SM who seems to know no fear and has trouble seeing it in others a rare genetic disorder has destroyed the amygdala in this otherwise healthy woman. When Adolf showed the woman dozens of photographs of common facial expressions, she could readily identify happiness and disgust and surprise. However, she had difficulty identifying mixed emotions. Fearful expressions mystified her completely. Judging from the woman's response and conversation, Adolf expressed that damage to her amygdala means that she has not only fails to recognize fear, but also does not feel it at, the gut, at a gut level. He reports when she talks about instances when she feels afraid, there isn't the tension in her voice that you or I have. Rather, he seems, he, he says SM uh, seems adroit at recognizing rationally when she should be afraid based on cues such as loud voices, dark alleys, or cars and, and speeding at her, and thus manages to stay out of harm's way. Because everyday life is rich with such signals, the woman functions fairly normally and claims she does not feel at all impaired. She is unconcerned, says Adolphs. Though one could argue that's a symptom of her problem. On the basis of this research on the amygdala, New in New York University, Joseph Ledoux concludes that emotion and cognition are separate but interacting 
of mental functions mediated by separate but interacting brain systems, he suggests that the visual stimulus, such as the sight of a snake, may travel to the amygdala in a few thousandths of a second, triggering a physiological response, a process that he would describe as the emotion of fear. In his mind, that is distinct from the conscious feeling of fear. Feelings, Ledoux argues, arise from second, slower pathway that travels through the amygdala to the higher cortex. Using information from different parts of the brain, the cortex analyzes the frightening stimulus in detail and sends the message back down to the amygdala. If the message is that the fit false alarm, the snake, was really a stick, the cortex will try to ab abort the amygdala's alarm signal. The person may stick still experience a jolt because of the initial arousal of the amygdala. This double wiring sometimes creates problems. Neural connections from the cortex down to the amygdala are less well developed than their connections with the amygdala back to the once the cortex. Thus the amygdala seems to exert greater influence on the cortex than vice versa. Once an emotion has been turned on, it's difficult to turn it off. This is why we have trouble controlling our emotions, included Ledoux. They can really trip us up. The amygdala has 12 to 15 distinct re regions. Only two have been clearly implicated in fear. Other emotions may reside in similar circuits, uh, but their anatomy has not been traced. Okay. Although blowing off steam may be temporarily calm and angry person, it may also amplify underlying hostility and it may provoke retaliation. The, cartho the catharsis hypothesis maintains that releasing aggressive energy through action or fantasy reduces anger. Research has not supported the catharsis hypothesis. Angry outbursts may be reinforcing, therefore habit forming. In contrast, anger expressed as, expressed as non causing statements of feeling can benefit relationships by leading to the reconciliation rather than retaliation. When reconciliation fails, forgiveness can reduce one's anger and, and physical symptoms. So anger carries the mind away uh, but makes the coward brave. Causes of a anger, people generally become angry with friends and loved ones who commit wrongdoings, especially if they are willful, unjustified, and avoidable. People are also angered by foul odors, high temperatures, and traffic jams. The Carthesis hypothesis suggests that venting anger through action or fantasy achieves, achieves an emotional release or catharsis. Ex however, expressing anger breeds more anger, and through reinforcement, through reinforcement, it becomes habit forming. And it turns out that the catharsis hypothesis is generally considered inaccurate. Although blowing off steam may temporarily calm an angry person, it may amplify underlying hostility, and it may provoke retaliation. The Carthesis hypothesis maintains that releasing aggressive energy through action or fantasy reduces anger. Uh, research has not supported the Carthesis hypothesis. Scott Geller, a psychologist at Virginia Polytechnic Institute at the State University, argues that urbanization, dual income families, and workplace downsizing have left people in crowded communities with more to do and less time to do it. People feel rushed and their stress is particularly noticeable when they drive. Other psychologists have suggested that cars promote de-individuation. De the loss of self-awareness and evaluation and apprehension reduces restraints on aggression. Jeffrey Davenbacher poses the question that you might, that someone cuts you off while you are driving the highway or steals the parking space you've been wait, waiting for, that you should take a deep breath and move on. Honk and move on. Or repeatedly honk, yell out, and pound your fists against the steering wheel. Wondering how the other person even got a driver's license in the first place. Doffenbacher notes that even typically calm, reasonable people sometimes turn into angry warriors who choose the third alternative. 
Anger is not a chronic experience for high, high anger drivers, uh, reports Stauffenbarger, but something promoted by, diff but by a different trigger or events on the road. It's about encountering provocation, events on the road that are frustrating and provoking in some way, and then that and then when, when what they bring to the wheel determines how angry they will get. When provoked on the road, they yell out obscenities, wildly gesture, honk, swerve, and in and out of traffic in general, and endanger the lives of others as well as their own. His study suggests that high anger drivers tend to practice, host practice hostile, aggressive thinking, they report greater disbelief about how others drive. They have more vengeful and retaliatory thoughts than low anger drivers. And in extreme cases, they may plot ways to physically harm those drivers who have proved frustrating to them. To take greater risks on the road, in comparison to low anger drivers, they move often speed typically 10 to 20 miles over the speed limit. They rapidly switch lanes they, and they tailgate. They also behave more aggressively. High anger drivers commonly report swearing or name calling or yelling at the driver or honking in anger. They pro report being angry slightly more than twice a day and an average just over two aggressive behaviors per day. In comparison, low anger drivers are angry less than once a day and average less than one aggressive behavior per, per day. This pattern holds true for low and high anger drivers who drive equivalent number of miles. Having more, they also have more anger er, accidents. High anger drivers have twice as many accidents, either from a collision with another car or from an off-road crash. They also report more near accidents, receive more traffic tra tickets, experience more trait anger, anxiety, and impulsiveness. High anger drivers are more likely to get in a car angry from work or home or stress. In general, they tend to express anger in a more outward and less controlled ways as they react impulsively. Interestingly, Daffenbacher reports that high anger drivers are not angry all the time uh, when they drive. Driving on unimpeded country roads, as they did in one of his studies computer program situations, high and low anger drivers reported similar levels of low anger. Geller and Beasley have suggested a new way to reduce aggressive driving. Install a tiny green light at the back of every car and teach drivers to say please. One flash, thank you, two flashes, and I'm sorry, three flashes. The two have deployed the flash, a thumb-sized light that is attached to the Velcro to the rear window and is powered by a cigarette lighter. The flash can be seen in the front and back and is activated by pushing a remote control button. With the support of the National Institute of Health grant, the device is currently being road tested. The feel-good, do-good phenomenon refers to people's tendency to to be helpful when already in a good mood. Mood boosting experiences make us more likely to give money, pick up someone's dropped papers, volunteer time, and do other good deeds. After decades of focusing on negative emotions, psychologists are now actively exploring causes and consequences consequences of subjective well-being, self-perceived happiness or satisfaction with others. Scientific research helps us sort through the many contradictory maxims we have inherited, regardless of the predictors of happiness. Boys respond to anger by moving away from that situation while girls talk to their friends or listen to music. Anger breeds prejudice. The 9-11 attacks led to an intolerance towards immigrants and Muslims. Uh, the expression of anger is more encouraged in cultures that do not promote group behavior than in cultures that do promote group behavior. People who are happy perceive the world as being safer. They are able to make decisions easily, are more cooperative, and rate job applicants more favorably, and live healthier, energized, and more satisfied lives. That when we feel happy, we are more willing to help others. And subjective well-being is the self-perceived feeling that the new positive psychology is on the rise.
Our positive moods rise to the maximum within six to seven hours after waking up. Negative moods stay more or less the same throughout the day. Positive emotions rise over the early and middle part of our day while our negative emotions is highest just after we wake up and before we go to sleep. Of those stressful events trigger bad moods, the gloom nearly always lists by the next day. Times of elation are similarly hard to sustain, and over the long run, our emotional ups and downs tend to balance. Even significant bad days, such as serious illness, seldom destroy happiness for long. The surprising reality is that we underestimate the duration of our emotions and underestimate our capacity to adapt. Within most affluent societies, the wealth or wealthy are somewhat happier than those who struggle to afford life's basic needs. At a basic level, money helps us to avoid pain by enabling better nutrition, health care, and education, which in turn increases happiness. Sudden increases in wealth can also increase in the happiness in the short term. However, in the long run, increased affluence hardly affects happiness. For example, during the last four decades, the average U.S. citizen's buying power more than doubled, yet the average American is considered to be no happier. Research does not show an increase in happiness accompanying affluence at either the individual or national level. In affluent societies, people with more money are happier than people who struggle with their basic needs. People in rich countries are happier than people in poor countries. A sudden rise in financial conditions makes people happy. However, people who live in poverty or in the slums are also satisfied with their life. Wealth is like health. Its utter absence can breed misery, yet having it is no guarantee of happiness. Subjective well-being is measured in 82 countries, shows Puerto Rico and Mexico at the top of the list, even though they're poorer countries. Students who value love more than money report higher life satisfaction. And adaption level phenomena, like the adaption to brightness, volume, and touch, people adapt to income levels. Satisfaction has a short half-life. The adaption level phenomenon describes our tendency to judge various stimuli relative to those we have previously experienced. If our income or social prestige increases, we may feel initial pleasure. However, we then adapt to this new level of achievement, come to see it as normal, and require something better to give us another surge of happiness. This helps explain why, despite the realities of triumph and tragedy, million-dollar winners and people who are paralyzed report sim similar levels of happiness. Relative deprivation is a perception that one is worse off relative to those with whom one compares oneself. As people climb the ladder of success, they mostly compare themselves with those who are at or above their current level, and this explains why, why increases in income may do little to increase happiness. Happiness is not only relative to our past, but also comparison with others. Relative deprivation is a perception that we are relatively worse off than those we compare ourselves with. And so why are some people generally more happy? Uh, how, uh, uh, researchers have found that happy people, people tend to have high self-esteem. They tend to be optimistic, outgoing, and agreeable. They have close friendships and satisfying marriage. They have work and leisure and engage their skills. They have meaningful religious faith. They sleep well and exercise. However, happiness seems not much related to other factors such as age, gender, though women are more often depressed and, and but also more joyful than men, education levels, uh, parenthood, and physical attractiveness do not seem to have much of an effect on happiness.
Research suggests that we can increase our level of happiness by realizing the enduring happiness doesn't come from financial success, taking control of our time and acting happy, seeking work and leisure that engages our skills, exercising regularly and getting adequate sleep, giving priority to close relationships, focusing beyond oneself and being grateful that we have 10 nurturing or spiritual selves. Recent research on two important dimensions of positive affect extends to the text discussions of the happiness of adaptive value. Ute Nuzman and her research team at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development make an important distinction between dimensions of positive effect, namely pleasant effect and positive involvement. Pleasant effect is assessed by the frequency in which people report feeling exuberant, happy, proud, amused, and cheerful. Positive involvement is measured by the frequency in which people feel interested, alert, inspired, attentive, and attractive. These researchers found that the two dimensions are only moderately correlated. In their study, uh, Kuzensman and her colleagues examined the relationship between these two different dimensions of positive affect and lifestyle. To assess the lifestyle, they used the self-reported values, everyday activities, and activity aspirations. They reported the following. Pleasant effect, but not positive involvement, was related to hedonic lifestyle. The pattern was found for both values and everyday activities. That is, adults who tended to experience pleasant effect frequently were likely to hold values related to pleasurable life, intimacy, and social approval. They also pr pursue related activities for themselves or to make a visit to a party, go dancing, and do something with friends. Positive involvement, but not pleasant effect, was related to the growth-related lifestyle. That is, adults who tended to experience positive involvement were likely to hold values related to personal growth, the well-being of family and friends, and societal engagement. They pursue related everyday activities. Pleasant effect and positive involvement were also linked to people's activity aspirations. That is, these activities they would pursue if they were had extra resources, time, and money. People tending to experience pleasant effect were likely to report hedonic aspirations. Uh, for example, uh, buy a big house, talk to more friends, uh, etc. And were unlikely to report growth-related aspirations, such as visit museums around the world or read classic books. For people who experienced positive involvement, the opposite was true. The authors observed that hedonic and growth-related aspiration measures were not independent. That is, participants could report six activity aspirations, which were coded to reflect mutually exclusive categories. Thus, the participant who reported more hedonic activity aspirations had to report fewer growth-related aspirations. Respondents were from 15 to 70 years of age. This was negatively related to pleasant effect and hedonic lifestyles, but positively re related to positive involvement and growth-related lifestyle. This finding seems consistent with recent lifespan theories, emphasizing that becoming older uh, involves not only losses, but also gains, particularly in personality functioning. Clearly, the present study contributes to growing literature focusing on the positive adulthood and age. The researchers highlight the importance of considering two dimensions of positive effect and pleasant feelings and positive involvement separately when studying the link between the effect and lifestyle. This concludes Chapter 13 of AP Psychology uh, on Emotion. I hope you find this useful. Uh, any positive feedback I could receive to, to be helpful or constructive feedback would also be helpful. Um, thank you for your patience.